Okay, pursuant to House Rule 10.01, I call Human Services Finance and Policy to order. Today, members, we have a full agenda. We have six bills up, so we will be spending roughly 15 minutes on each bill. That means we'll be limiting testimony to two minutes for each testifier, and I'm going to initially limit uh, the number of questions to one question per member. And note that, members, if these bills appear in our Human Services Omnibus will have another chance to um, take more questions and amendments. And with that, we'll ask, uh, I'll ask Ms. Hansen to take the roll, please. Yeah. Chair Schultz. Present. Vice Chair Bonner. Lead Albright. Present. Representative Bolden. Present. Representative Burkle. Present. Representative Fisher. Fisher, present. Representative Frederick. Present. Representative Hansen. Representative Keel. Representative present. Liebling. Oh, sorry. Thank you. That's okay. Thank you. Representative Liebling. Liebling present. Thank you. Representative Muller. Present. Representative Nor. Representative Navani. Navani present. Representative Pearson. Pearson present. Representative Pinto. Present. Thank you. Representative Rasmussen. Rasmussen present. Representative Robin. I think she's coming soon. Representative Sandell. Present. Representative Schumacher. Thank you, members. Okay, members, we have a quorum. Thank you. Thank you for joining us at 830 this morning. And just a reminder, we're going to break um, at 10 recess and then come back at 1030 to take up two bills from Representative Edelson on background studies and then to start our discussion on the governor's budget and supplemental budget. Okay, let's see. Vice Chair Bonner, would you like to move the minutes from March 19th? Yes, Madam Chair, I'd like to move the minutes from March 19th. Thank you. Representative Bonner moves the minutes. Any discussion of the minutes? Seeing none, all those in favor of approving the minutes from March 19th, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? And the motion prevails and the minutes are approved. Okay, so the first bill for consideration is House File 312. So I'll move House File 312 so it's in front of the committee. And this bill will be laid over for possible inclusion in our Human Services Finance Bill. Welcome back, Representative Becker Finn. It looks like you have an A4 amendment. Would you like to for me to move that amendment? Uh, yes, please, Madam Chair. Can you describe it briefly? Yep. Uh, so the A4 amendment uh, is mostly cleaning up uh, some some things, as well as uh, extending the deadline uh, for when the bill would uh, be uh, imposed, and then also changing the funding uh, to to DHS a bit. And I can talk about that more when I talk about the bill. Okay. So I'll move the A4 amendment on House File 312. All those in favor of moving the A4 amendment, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the motion prevails and the A4 amendment is adopted. Okay, to your bill, Representative Becker Finn. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, members, uh, for hearing this important bill. Uh, I know you have a really full agenda, so I'm gonna keep my comments pretty focused. Uh, the question before you in House File 312 is whether parents with low incomes should be appointed an attorney when facing termination of their parental rights. Uh, as the law stands now, the court the, the court shall appoint counsel in any case in which it feels that such an appointment is appropriate uh, if the person is financially unable to pay for their own attorney. And this feels that language is uh, both very permissive and subjective and honestly a bit unusual uh, when it comes to uh, language for, for the courts. Uh, the second part of the bill, and the reason the bill is in front of your committee, uh, addresses the issue of how these attorneys would be paid and where those funds would come from. Um, it's admittedly been a very difficult nut to crack. Uh, so these attorneys were initially funded through, um, the public defender's office was picking up the, the tab for that, but it's now been over a decade um, since the public defender's office stopped doing that. Um, counties have been figuring out different ways to, to pay for that. And so what the A4 amendment did is uh, fund some positions within DHS uh, to help counties 
access federal 4E funds. Um, Hennepin County has been very successful in being, a, being able to do that. And so uh, that's what the, the A4 amendment does. And that's where the funding would be through DHS um, so that the counties would be able to access additional funds uh, through those federal dollars. And then once that gets set up, that would be an ongoing funding source for them. Um, and I, I do have a testifier and I wanna make sure we have time for her and then uh, I am available for questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Becker Finn. The first testifier we have is Adrian Baker. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and begin your testimony. Hello, good morning. My name is Adrian Baker. Thank you for having me here today. Uh, I'm a law student at Mitchell Hamlin School of Law and I'm also work with the Institute to Transform Child Protection as a policy student. I'm here to testify before you today to give you a brief background of the parent representation bill. This bill would require the appointment of an attorney for indigent parents in child welfare cases. And currently Minnesota does not mandate appointment for counsel uh, in, for parents in child protection cases. So many parents in Minnesota are as a result not represented at that initial hearing um, after their child has been removed from their home. Additionally, uh, as, Chair, as uh, Representative Beckerfin indicated, um, different counties are pro provide representation to parents in different ways. And ultimately this inconsistency is harmful to families. Research is clear when parents have well-trained attorneys from the first hearing on, children do better in the longer term and they remain home in more stable reunifications than when parents do not have legal representation. Over the past eight months, we have worked closely on this parent representation bill with numerous stakeholders including county attorneys, parent attorneys, the judiciary, and Minnesota Association of Counties. During this time, we developed two working groups uh, regarding budget and logistics uh, to consider all perspectives. And ultimately, we appreciate the dynamic and collaborative effort to make this important initiative a reality for families across Minnesota. Thank you. My professor, Joanna Woolman, uh, is available to answer questions on this bill. Thank you, Ms. Baker. The second testifier we have is Matt Freeman. Welcome, Mr. Freeman. Please state your name and affiliation and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, name is Matt Freeman. I'm the Executive Director um, for the Minnesota Association of County Social Service Administrators, MAXA, and representing uh, human service directors in all 87 counties. I'm here to testify on behalf of MAXA and the Association of Minnesota Counties. As uh, Representative Becker Finn stated, um, since 2008, parental representation has been an unfunded mandate to counties, which has resulted in some variability across the state and how representation is achieved. And that variability is related to resources as well as access to parental attorneys. Counties recognize the worthwhile intents of this legislation if it's correctly implemented. We recognize remaining issues with program administration, recruitment and retention of qualified and culturally competent attorneys, costs to implement and maintain the recommended rec uh, requirements, and division of funding between the state and counties for contracting for those services. Our concerns with the bill as introduced are outlined in a letter, but I wanna speak specifically to the A4 amendment that's presented today. That amendment strips the bill of funding for counties that pay for expansion of an already unfunded mandate. In our discussions with the work group and with the, transform, uh, the Institute to Transform Child Protection, um, there was a commitment to, to include funding with the proposal so as not to expand that unfunded mandate and address the disparities across our state. Um, going as far as the Institute assuring counties in conversations that they would not be interested in moving forward the provision without funding. Um, the Institute has represented to us that one of the barriers to including funding to counties lies in uh, challenges with DHS administering the initial proposed funds to counties. We'd be interested in finding a different agency or a different location if that is the challenge. I also wanna highlight that though federal Title IV-E funding is presented as a way to alleviate this cost, implementation of federal IV-E funding is an uncertain, incomplete, and administrative burdensome reimbursement source for EPC hearings. In 2019, federal policy changed to create a potential partial uh, financial resource through the federal Title IV-E uh, for some parental representation. 
However, this only provides reimbursement at a rate of less than 50% of the administrative expenditures for representation of a child, and only if they are Title IV E eligible, potentially providing only a portion of, for the cost. We expect a large number of children will not be Title IV E eligible. That's our experience. Um, informally, I've been told that 30% uh, eligibility would be a strong number in counties. And so 50% of that 30% leaves uh, a significant amount of um, that not, not funded. So applying for reimbursement through 4E is an administratively intense task, and navigating this new funding is a costly administrative obligation. Hennepin County is currently engaging in a pilot to explore this new opportunity, um, but as of now, no counties have yet seen Title IV E reimbursements received. Hennepin County has billed, but has not yet received dollars, is my understanding. And this is more than a year after the eligibility requirements were amended. So um, for human services, the additional administrative effort to verify eligibility comes with no additional funding. Um, the funds that will be received for 4 E go towards uh, the representation. Thus, human services staff uh, will go away from administering programs and working towards um, meeting this uh, administrative requirement. My understanding that in Hennepin County, human services has had to add a full-time uh, employee to administer paperwork to satisfy um, their needs for applying for the Title IV E funding within the pilot. So funds received don't, again, go back to human services, but towards mitigating the cost of attorneys. And for counties with less resources, this means taking on administrative burden of applying for those funds directly affecting human service budgets. I'd also like to raise up concern that although attorneys are ultimately administered by the courts, Max is concerned that the shortage of parental attorneys across the state may create challenges in scheduling and result in a delayed permanency for children, which creates a concern from a human service standpoint. Um, happy to take questions, but um, lastly from, from Max, a dedicated funding source is really a necessary part of reforming parental representation and really encourage the committee um, to include that in this bill uh, to adequately um, allow us to address representing the legal interests of parents. Thank you, Mr. Freeman. Representative Becker Finn, can you talk about the appropriation and then if you wanted to follow up with some of the uh, testimony? Yeah, uh, thank you, ma'am. Madam Chair, and, and as the as the last testifier noted, uh, since 2008, uh, this has been an unfunded uh, piece uh, that counties have to deal with. So I just want to note that currently right now, counties receive zero dollars uh, from the state to uh, to pay for these attorneys. And so um, I think it's as I as I said, it's been a really difficult nut to crack because uh and it's actually been further complicated by McKenna's law. Folks will remember that uh, that passed a couple of years ago, which is a great, great law that um, requires counsel through the public defender's office for children who are 10 or older um, in these proceedings. And um, it makes it much more difficult uh, to appoint uh, then to also appoint a public, you know, so we couldn't just go straight back to going to appointing public defenders to represent the parents because the public defenders are already representing the children. Um, we have talked to, we have looked at a, a tax way to pay for this. We have looked at, we have talked to DHS, the Office of Justice Programs, the courts, the guardian ad litems, the public defenders. There, There is just um, not a a perfect option um, of where to house this. And I think long-term, we do all need to start thinking about uh, an office of parent representation, which is how other, other states have done it. Um, but in the meantime, uh, you know, every single one of these hearings that happens without an attorney present is, uh, is really a, a burden and, you know, is, can, really a lot of trauma for children and families. Um, and I, uh, I do want to note uh, that uh, I do want to correct that H Hennepin County has received a million dollars uh, in federal 4E funds. Um, it, it was a pilot project, but it's been very successful. And uh, that is one of the reasons that the A4 amendment is, is funding DHS to help other counties figure out how to access those funds. Um, and it, it, it's, they, I mean, Hennepin County has received the funds, so it, it is working. We've figured it out. It was certainly a challenge for that county initially, but uh, the hope is that with some DHS staff uh, able to assist counties you know, having that be a full-time position that they would be able to help other counties access those funds as well. 
Thank you, Representative Becker Finn. It looks like the appropriation is 192,000 in uh, the first year and then 215,000 in 2023. Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Chair. Is there anyone on the call this morning from DHS? Representative Albright, this is, okay. this is Lisa Bailey. I am on the phone. Thank you. Commissioner Bailey, please uh, stay with us. Representative Albright, can you state your one question, please? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I understand in the testimony from both the Max as well as from uh, Representative Becker Finn with regard to the Hennepin County uh, pilot program, uh, a number of the advocates have said that your agency has uh, a conflict of interest in terms of how to administer it. Um, and we've been, uh, obviously, as uh, Representative Becker Finn uh, stated pretty quickly, uh, not too many other places to house this. So how do you intend to resolve this? Or are you still able to resolve it? It certainly seems like the conflict of interest has not gone away. Uh, so we're still sitting with an unresourced and unfunded county mandate. Uh, how would you respond to that? Ms. Bailey? Chair Schultz, uh, Representative Albright, the uh, well, department strongly represents, first of all, the, the concept and the need for this high quality parent representation in these child protection matters. And um, in terms of the uh, 4E, the assistance with allowing counties uh, to draw down those 4E funds, we think that is something that's workable. That's something that we've been doing this year, as Mr. Freeman noted, uh, in a pilot project and has been um, has been quite successful, it, and we would need those additional uh, staff to assist with that. The concern with the conflict of interest is if the if the department were to be the conduit for actual funds outside of 4E funds, there would be a potential conflict there. And that would be because, of course, the DHS uh, oversees the child protection system uh, big picture, and that these children are potentially uh, at some point, wards of the state. In other words, they would be committed to the care of the Commissioner of, of Human Services, uh, potentially uh, creating a conflict of interest there. So uh, in terms of the 4E assistance, we think that that is something that would be workable. We certainly want to uh, assist in any way we can to, to make this happen. Thank you, Ms. Bailey. Representative Rasmussen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my question is for Mr. Freeman. You know, Mr. Freeman, you talked about the potential cost of counties, both in terms of implementation and for funding uh, the councils that would be required in this bill. I was wondering, Mr. Freeman, with your conversations with the counties, um, do you have any idea on where this money potentially would or could come from? You know, is this going to come from uh, child protective services budgets that could be spent, um, you know, uh, on um, ensuring that children are safe, or is it going to go to property taxpayers in the counties or come out of the human services budget. Um, if you could give some light on, you know, how this unfunded mandate is going to be met, that'd be greatly appreciated. Mr. Freeman. Madam Chair, Representative Rasmussen, thank you for the question. Um, currently, counties do uh, cover the parental representation in instances in which the court indicates um, that's appropriate. And so they are paying a significant amount um, for those resources. I believe by county, they're be paid through the county administrator's office. And so it's funds uh, administered by the county board and those are uh, property tax uh, levy dollars. Um, this bill would expand that to include all EPC hearings. And so we would expect that that cost um, would increase. And then the other impact to human services would be administering or, or processing the Title IV E dollars. We do know Again, not all will be eligible for the Title IV E dollars. And equally, there's paperwork, um, financial eligibility, and others that needs to be collected in order to be eligible to seek those dollars. We expect that human services will be um, a part of collecting that information. And so that will be administrative costs as well as administrative costs for um, uh, uh, managing uh, administrative centrally through the county administrator. So I would expect it's county levy dollars that um, would be put towards the parental representation costs and then administrative costs to human services. Thank you, Mr. Freeman. Representative Becker-Finn, any closing comments? 
Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. And I just want to note that as it stands right now, counties are carrying and have carried this obligation for over a decade. Um, so really, this is this is an opportunity for us to to move the ball. And uh, you know, at any any point, because it is subjective, the courts could feel like. Um, appointing counsel in every single one of these hearings as it stands right now. And so, uh, again, I just want to take it back to the overall the goal here and the question before us is whether parents with lower incomes should be appointed an attorney when facing termination of their parental rights. And I think um, that question is uh, is ultimately what what we're dealing with and, and why we're bringing this bill forward. I will also say that uh, conversations will continue. And um, it, this this is certainly, as I noted, a, a really difficult one because of the, you know, all the things that have been noted in the conversation here. So would really appreciate support and appreciate you hearing this bill, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Becker Finn, and thank you for working on these issues. It's really appreciated. So with that, members, um, House file, 312 as amended will be laid over for possible inclusion. The next uh, file we have bill for consideration is House file 1943. I'll move 1943 so it's in front of the committee. And House file 1943 will also be laid over for possible inclusion in our <clears throat> human services finance bill. Representative Pinto, um, please tell us about House file 1943. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, and thanks for giving the bill a hearing. Um, members, House File 1943 relates to the interaction between the sex trafficking of young people and our child welfare system. Before 2014, our state's standard response to the sex trafficking of young people was actually to charge them with a crime to direct them to the juvenile delinquency system. And that year in 2014, we finally uh, fixed that by adopting the safe harbor law, which directs them instead to the child welfare system, um, which makes great sense, except that that system uh, in that system, child protection agencies are required to investigate the situation, which is good, but to interview the alleged offender, which typically is a parent or a caregiver, a teacher, that all makes sense. But when you have a non-caregiver sex trafficker, um, that can really cause a lot of problems. Uh, both it can put the, the child more at risk, it can interfere with the law enforcement investigation of those situations. And I should note, members may be aware, but in my work outside the legislature, I work as a prosecutor and have specialized a lot in these cases and actually was the statewide director of training and protocol development for the safe harbor system. So a lot of familiarity with that. So this gets us to the bill. So more than 200 stakeholders uh, got together and developed the response that's in this bill. Uh, it's uh, the non-caregiving uh, sex trafficking assessment. Um, it removes the interview requirement for non-caregiver uh, sex trafficking offenders. Uh, it directs uh, have law enforcement do that investigation. And it um, provides for training and has sort of a separate track that goes in. You'll see a number of letters in support on the committee website. This will bring our state in full compliance with the Federal Justice for Victims of Trafficking Act. And the final note before I turn to the testifiers, just to say that DHS actually worked with the stakeholders and advanced this previously. This was heard in HHS policy last term just before the pandemic, I think March 13th. Um, this is not a priority for the department this session. They're just prioritizing other things, but they've been real helpful. So I do have one testifier and then uh, move to questions. And thank you so much, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Pinto. The first testifier I have is Kyla Marie Granda. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name and affiliation and proceed with your testimony. Um, good morning, Chair, committee members. My name is Keila Marie Granda, and I'm with Unspoken Voices. Um, I am testifying this, this morning on behalf of this in support of it. Um, my education, I hold a bachelor, a double bachelor's in um, counseling and pastoral ministries. Um, I have my LIDC licensure and I um, have a master's in criminal justice specializing in fields such as this, um, uh, prevention, intervention, rehabilitation. Um, I also am about two thirds of the way towards my PhD and I'm specializing in human trafficking and that intersectionality. So I bring, I want to bring not only my professional experience, um, my educational experience, but my my professional as an advocate as well. Um, I've worked uh, in the fields of advocacy since uh, I was about 18. So it's, it's been a couple of decades, um, but I've also been in the system. I was in the system as a youth and I was trafficked and um, I was, um, I was trafficked by both, I would say more non-familial family members. And in my case, there was not enough. Um, there was not enough, um, integrity, there was not enough investigation, there was not enough done. And in the cases of so many children that I see that I currently work with, even last year, um, 
you know, in shuffling and trying to do the different pieces with Safe Harbor and, and all of the reform we've done, it's been amazing, but there's been some gaps and this is a gap area. And, and so just very quickly, um, you know, looking even from my own experience, and then bringing in the story of a young girl I worked with last year who was 14 and she was being trafficked in a rural community in West Central Minnesota um, and, and trafficked through um, and, and being trafficked you know, back down south and by a non-familial family member. And the county had no idea what to do. Law enforcement had no idea what to do. It turned into this perpetual cycle. Um, and then finally they just said, well, we don't have enough and hands off and nothing was done and that little girl and that traffic were left and so nothing was done and that's why things like this need to happen because we need that law enforcement piece um we need the safety and that's what that gives the victim survivors in this case is it gives them a chance for safety for um themselves and and for their families um so that's why i'm in support of this um yeah so thank you so much for listening to me Thank you, Ms. Granda, for sharing your experience, and thank you for your advocacy and, and working in this area. So for questions, we have Katie Erickson from Hennepin County Child Protections and Sarah Ladd from DHS. So are there any questions for the bill author, the testifier, or our experts? Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Representative Pinto, thank you for bringing this bill forward. I appreciate the effort that you and the task force have put into this. <clears throat> Just a simple question in terms of, uh, you know, naturally we want to be investigating those that are per perpetrating such a, 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 a an awful um, effort against these kids. But in most cases, my sense would be that the, the family members, the parents might be also aware, if not just uh, solely implicitly. So um, in, in instances where that, is possible, are we excluding them from the investigation or do they continue or would they continue to be assessed in addition to the non-caregiver sex trafficker? Representative Pinto. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think I would direct that to Ms. Ladd or Ms. Erickson. I'm not sure which of them, maybe one of them. I see Ms. Ladd unmuting, so she may mm -hmm. be able to help sure. there. Ms. Ladd, please introduce yourself. And Good proceed. morning, Madam Chair and representatives of the committee. My name is Sarah Ladd. I am the Human Trafficking Child Protection Coordinator at the Department of Human Services in the Child Safety and Permanency Division. And thank you so much for the question. My response to that would be that if the parents and caregivers of the child victim are aware or involved in the sex trafficking of the child, that there would still be a requirement to do an investigation if they are part of the offense itself. So they would be considered alleged offenders. The creation of this new response would not in any way detract from the ability to hold parents and caregivers accountable if they are alleged offenders in trafficking situations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Ladd. Any other questions from members? Seeing none, Representative Pinto, any closing comments? Again, thank you so much, Madam Chair, uh, for uh, for accommodating this. And uh, members, really, I would urge your support. I, I'll just note that there is a, a fiscal note uh, that is still being finalized, um, but uh, we expect the cost to be around one hundred and forty thousand dollars from the in the the first fiscal year, and then a, a much lesser cost uh, going forward. But I know we'll be looking at that. Thank you again uh, for your support. Thank you, Representative Pinto. So House File 1943 will be laid over for possible inclusion in our Human Services Finance Bill. The next bill for consideration is House File 2084. I'll move House File 2084 so it's before the committee and it will be laid over for possible inclusion. Representative Jordan, welcome to the committee. Is she here? I don't see Representative Jordan. Is she here, Ms. Hansen? No. No, she's not here yet. So let's move on to House File 2011. And we will come back to House File 2084. So we will um, I'll move to table that. 
House file 2011. Let's see. First, we need to move the, the division report for House file 2011. Chair Fisher, would you like to make the motion? Uh, yes, Madam Chair. I'd like to move the uh, behavioral division report on House file 2011, please. Okay, so Chair Fisher moves to adopt the division report from behavioral health. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion prevails and the division report is adopted. So House Fell 2011, I'll move so it's before the committee now since we adopted the committee, re the division report. Representative Katiza Watoon, welcome to the committee. Are you here? I'm not seeing Representative Katiza Watoon. Looks like she's here. She is here. here. Oh, good. Representative Katiza Watoon, the, your bill is before us. You are muted. Not table. Chair Schultz. Okay. Uh, Representative Jordan just entered. <laughs> if you'd like to go back. <laughs> okay, we're going to go back and you can just <laughs> ignore my, my motion to table because that requires a voice vote. So we can take bills in any order. So we'll go back to House File 2084. Sorry, everyone. So I'll move 2084. So it's before the committee. It will be laid over for possible inclusion. Representative Jordan to your bill, House File 2084. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and good morning, members. Um, Thank you so much for your consideration of House File 2084, which provides funding for recovery community organizations in Minnesota or RCOs. RCOs are community-based nonprofits that provide free non-clinical recovery support services for anyone who needs help at any point in the recovery journey. This could include things like one-to-one -one coaching from peer recovery specialists, linked to resources to support an individual recovery journey, such as housing, employment, healthcare, et cetera, and also a friendly, recovery-friendly environment to focus on their health. One point, Madam Chair members, I think is especially important for you to understand is that RCOs are part of the continuum of care for people with substance abuse disorder. Recovery differs from treatment. So treatment is like the surgery for a torn ACL and treatment is the physical therapy and primary care someone may work on for ex in an extended period of time. RCOs are culturally specific and they fill in the gaps people need before, during and after treatment. So this is a bill to address a lack of investment by the state to support recovery. The funding in this bill is necessary as most of the services RCOs provide do not qualify as billable expenses. Minnesota lags behind other states, including Georgia, Vermont, and Massachusetts in recognizing the necessity of RCOs and providing funding similar to the bill here. Like many Minnesotans, I have family members, friends, and people I love on that same continuum of their recovery. All of their recoveries journeys have been unique and some of them have been in treatment programs and all of them are good people who deserve to live their lives with dignity and respect. My loved ones, like all people, need services to manage their health like any other condition. It's not easy, and like so many Minnesotans, they can't do it alone. So here to talk more about what RCOs do, I'd like to turn it over to Major John Donovan to talk about his work serving the St. Cloud area. And I also have Wendy Jones, the Executive Director of the Minnesota Recovery Connection, to answer technical questions members may have. Thank you, Representative Jordan. And the appropriation is $2 million in each year of the biennium. So welcome, Major John Donovan, to the committee. Please state your name and affiliation for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. I am Major John Donovan, the Director of the Recovery Community Organization, the Recovery Community Network in Central Minnesota. I have a brief statement that I would like to read. Again, thank you, Madam Chair, and good morning, esteemed members of this committee of the Minnesota House of Representatives. I am Major John Donovan, a veteran of two combat tours in Iraq and a nine-month peacekeeping mission with the Minnesota National Guard to Bosnia-Herzegovina during Governor Pawlenty's administration. I retired from the Minnesota National Guard in March of 2018. My undergraduate degree is from St. Cloud State University, go Huskies, and my graduate degree is from Boston University. But of all the aforementioned items, the thing that I am most proud of is I am a person in long-term recovery. It's been over 42 years since I've had a drink. No matter who you are, war changes a person. Whether you served as a cook or in combat, whether you served in the infirmary 
or in the infantry, the experiences of being in war fundamentally change a person. You are never the same. For some, the change is hardly noticeable, but it is there. Still others have troubles readjusting to civilian life, and those changes manifest themselves in divorce, depression, drug abuse, suicide. At the Recovery Community Network in Central Minnesota, we are providing peer services to our veterans, service members, and their families. The VA in St. Cloud is great, but it still requires someone to go to them. We go to the veteran. Allow me to illustrate. Tony, a combat veteran, received a scholarship from us to attend a Recovery Coach Academy in June of 2019. This workshop provides an attendee with the skill set to become a certified peer recovery specialist. Prior to the training, Tony was staying at the Eagles Healing Nest in Sauk Center. He was unemployed, struggling with recovery, and trying to find his place in the world post his combat experiences. This is what Tony said. This training completely changed my life. Today, I am a recovery coach for Sobriety First Treatment Center, and I get to pay it forward every day. Thank you. Minnesota Recovery Connection, and thank you, Recovery Community Network, for this amazing opportunity. Ladies and gentlemen, the work we are doing is making a difference and is serving those who served us. Investing in RCO infrastructure improves outcomes for all systems of care. We are here to compete with treatment providers. We're here to complete what they've started. Thank you for your time and attention, and may God bless all of you for the honorable work that you were doing on behalf of the great citizens of this great state of Minnesota. Thank you, Major Donovan. Looks like we have a question. I think it's Representative Novotny. Thank you, Chair. Uh, question for the author. Uh, how many of these individual grants are handed out, and what's the application process? Representative Jordan. Thank you, Representative Schultz. I think that would be a good question for um, Wendy Jones to answer. Thank you. Ms. Jones, please state your name and affiliation and proceed to answer the question. Thank and you, welcome Madam. to the committee. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Wendy Jones. I'm the Executive Director of Minnesota Recovery Connection. I'm also a person in long-term recovery from substance use disorder. The question is about how many grants there currently are. This is a, a different uh, grant process, and there's currently a small appropriation that is dedicated towards the funding of training of peer recovery specialists that's in, um, you know, handled by the Department of Human Services. There are only three communities currently eligible for that. Those are in Moorhead, the Twin Cities, and Rochester. Right now, there are three grants that have been administered through that, one of which the grant to Minnesota Recovery Connection, we have included the Recovery Community Network and Recovery Alliance Duluth in our grant because they were not eligible to apply uh, for various reasons in the existing statute. This is a new statute that is designed to focus on infrastructure for recovery community organizations, which provide a wide range of services, most of which are not billable, the current legislation really focuses on the peer recovery specialist workforce and training peer recovery specialists. The RCOs, again, Minnesota lacks in recovery community organizations around the state. There are none in all of Western Minnesota. Uh, this funding would enable uh, stabilization of the existing recovery community organizations and enable growth of new recovery community organizations in areas that are not currently being served by a recovery community organization. Thank you, Ms. Jones. Representative Albright. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Jordan, is there a companion for this in the Senate that's carried, traveling currently? Representative Jordan. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Representative Albright. There is not currently one introduced, but we've been working with March um, to work on um, Senate paths forward. Representative Liebling. Thank you, Madam Chair. My, my question is whether there is evidence of efficacy for this. I know there's a, you know, a lot of work being done in the in the area of SUD to think about which which th which um, 
approaches work better than other approaches? Is there any data in this area? Representative Jordan or Ms. Jones? Thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Leeling. I'll take that question. Um, yes, there is an incredible amount of mounting evidence, particularly nationally, about the efficacy of uh, or the efficiency of peer recovery support services. The Recovery Research Institute, based out of Harvard, recently published two long-term studies about recovery community organizations and uh, determined that they significantly increase recovery outcomes for individuals from a broad spectrum. There's significant research about peer recovery specialists when working within community systems. Minnesota Recovery Connection, for example, has been working with St. Joseph's Hospital through M Health Fairview, working with people who are coming out of a crisis situation. Those individuals who engaged with our peer recovery specialists have shown a 76% reduction in emergency department visits and a 71% reduction in hospitalizations, 90% reduction in visits that are related to substance use disorder. And this is a statistic that's on par with the use of peer recovery specialists in other systems around the country. Other studies show comparable statistics of a 71 to 80% redu reduction in hospitalizations. And that's just one example of where peer recovery specialists are used and peer recovery specialists connected to a recovery community organization stay with the individual when they leave the system, which is why RCOs are so critical. We're the filler in between the systems. And we stay with the person, not with the system. So someone may be working with a peer recovery specialist while they're incarcerated. They might leave that system the peer recovery specialist stays with them and works with them as they navigate to other elements of the system, whether that might be employment or a drug court. So there is an, uh, a lot of uh, evidence as through Harvard research, through individual states. Minnesota is lacking in its own research, and that is something that I would um, hope that the state would consider in the future but there is certainly significant evidence that recovery community organizations and peer recovery support services, when they're connected to RCOs, significantly <laughs> reduce costs and improve efficiency in treatment and entering treatment and sustaining recovery. Thank you, Ms. Jones. Representative Robbins. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Representative Jordan. I am new to this area of statute, so I was actually just looking up this section in 254B about what a recovery community organization is. And I just wondered if you could just explain for me as a person new to this, how does this interact with faith-based groups that do celebrate recovery or um, uh, the seven, you know, the 12-step programs and those sort of groups? How, what, what, if any, interaction do they have? Thank you. Ms. Jones. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Robbins. That's a great question. Recovery community organizations differ in a few ways. One is that we honor all pathways. So recovery community organizations are grounded in the principles of uh, there are multiple pathways to recovery and we're not going to tell you which one is the right one for you. We're going to work with you to help you find that. And so it's not exclusive of 12-step programs or faith-based programs. I like to think of recovery community organizations as sort of like department stores where there are a lot of options and we have really helpful trained peer recovery specialists who help you navigate all the options and support you as you try different things on and try to figure out, okay, this is going to work for me. Uh, often people have, when they're coming out of a particular treatment program, they've burned a lot of bridges in their community and they may not be able to go back to their faith. They may not be able to go back to um, a particular community of support that they had in the past. Recovery community organizations also serve that function as being sort of a neutral place where 
the, the, the participants there, the staff there, the volunteers there will help people navigate new systems of recovery and new support systems. Again, honoring all pathways, meeting people where they're at, and not doing for people, but doing with people. So think of RCOs as being a place for really helpful guides that have been professionally trained uh, in motivational interviewing, they've been trained in recovery resource navigation, ethics and boundaries. And so that's also what differs them from, uh, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous or another uh, community-based 12-step program is that the, the, the facilitators at recovery community organizations have a certification and a professional training that goes along with that to help people navigate systems and to honor all pathways. So a neutral department store, lots of options, helpful guides that can help you pick the right thing. <laughs> thank you, Ms. Jones, and thank you, Representative Robbins. I have one question before we go back to the bill author. Do the specialists become sponsors in the 12-step program or AA, um, or do they work with sponsors? Thank you, Madam Chair. That is completely up to the participant. Peer recovery specialists are not sponsors. Sponsors are affiliated with a 12-step program, and the goal of a sponsor is to help you work the steps. A peer recovery specialist goal is to help you set your recovery goals and help you meet those. And that may include working a 12-step program. So a peer recovery specialist may be helpful in getting you connected with a sponsor, but it's not the responsibility of a peer recovery specialist to be the sponsor. And that again aligns with this uh, philosophy of all pathways and helping someone find what works for them uh, 12 step 12 step programs work well for some people, but not for everyone. And so again, it comes back to being that trained neutral um, professional provider that has that lived experience of substance use disorder and recovery themselves who can help connect you with uh, a variety of options. Thank you, Ms. Jones. Any closing comments, Representative Jordan? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, one point I received some notification to Representative Albright's question that Senator Utke included this language in Senate File 1768. So there it there is a path in the Senate. The Senate, Senate is interested in this. This has bipartisan support, um, both here in the House and in the Senate. This is something that's critically important and it does really fill in gaps of care that we currently have existing in Minnesota. So I thank the committee for your time today and really cannot ask you enough for your support. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Representative Jordan. And I do believe that was heard in Rep Senator Abler's committee. I think I recall having um, listen to a hearing with it being discussed. Okay, with that, members, House File 2084 will be laid over for possible inclusion in our Human Services Finance Bill. Thank you, Representative Jordan, and thank you, testifiers. So the next item, we'll go back to House File 2011. We adopted the division report from Behavioral Health, so I'll move House File 2011 so it's before us. Representative Kutiza Watun, are you with us now? I am, Madam Chair. Thank well, you. I was dealing with the, the bus pickup. <laughs> I can understand. <laughs> welcome to our committee. Please present House File 2011. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Chair and members. Today, I would like to give you a little bit of background on House File 2011, the Youth Act. Um, for many children and youth, there are options to access community-based mental health services, especially school-linked mental health services that can meet their needs. But some youth will require more intensive mental health services. And unfortunately, there's very few resources for these youth and their families to access intensive mental health services in their communities. Last session, the legislature did pass some policy changes to the Youth Act program, but we still have work that we need to do. So House File 2011 focuses on one successful program to provide these supports in the community. Intensive Non-Residential Rehabilitative Mental Health Services, or Youth Act, provides a multidisciplinary and team-based approach that's modeled off of Assertive Community Treatment, or ACT, teams for the adult population. While eligibility criteria are different for Youth Act, both provide intensive supports in the community for children and youth with serious mental illnesses. The Youth Act team coordinates treatment for mental illness, school and employment, housing, 
family engagement, and physical health services. Currently, Guild Incorporated and Northern Pines Mental Health Center offer Youth Act services. While we do still have more work that needs to be done and to improve and sustain Youth Act, House File 2011 gets things started by allowing younger children and older youth to be eligible. This will increase much needed access for intensive mental health services for these children while allowing older youth to remain on Youth Act if the service is still beneficial to them and they're not yet eligible for an adult act team. So um, high points, uh, this bill expands eligibility for youth act services for children as young as eight years old and as old as 25 years old. One youth act team can treat children between the ages of eight and 16 or 14 to 25. And these teams must have specialized training for the age ranges that they serve. Um, and in section four, we have a technical fix to stipulate that tr the, tre the treatment team must complete an individual treatment plan for each client. Um, with that, Madam Chair, I, I do have two testifiers with me today and I would like to um, have them share their testimony. Sure. Thank you, Representative Cotiza. Between the first testifier I have is Addison Moore. Welcome to the committee. Please proceed with your testimony. Um, hi, I'm Addison. Um, dear representatives, I'm speaking to you today to share my story and express my support for expanding Youth Act team services to those 8 to 25. By authorizing this expansion, you have the ability to save lives, lives that are real people, real people that will make real change in this world. I started on the EQ Youth Act team in February of 2014. I was their second client and honestly, at times, probably one of their most difficult there was one time that I was in the middle of a family therapy session with the ACT team therapist there where I had already been suicidal and I decided that I was finished. I decided to run away barefoot in an attempt to end my life. The ACT team still continued to stick with me and didn't discharge me as all previous programs had or and or would have. They were a lifeline that when I had no one else and they were a lifeline when I had no one else and not just for me, but my entire family. They held on to the hope for my future that I didn't have, and honestly, I wasn't sure I ever would have. Prior to the EQ Act team, my mom was told that I was the lost cause. I would never have a job, never go to college, never live on my own, never drive a car, never contribute to society in any meaningful way. She was essentially told that I would be a burden to this world, living in a group home for the rest of my life. It is because of the faith because of the faith that EQ had in me that I learned that I could prove each and every one of those providers, police officers, paramedics, and educational professionals wrong. I do live in my own apartment with my dog, Saggy and Charlie. I got my driver's license in July of last year and have already driven over 40,000 miles. I really like to take road trips. I have spoken to high schools, colleges, police departments, and many other organizations throughout Minnesota and the nation with NAMI's public education program sharing my story and I now sit on the Minnesota State Subcommittee on Children's Mental Health. I would say that I am far from a burden to this society and I have a lot to offer this world. Expanding access to the Youth Act Team Program would allow others like myself who have been deemed lost causes, not to just survive, but to thrive to do great things in this world. This expansion can make it so that people who need more support than can be offered through other services have the ability to avoid residential treatment centers and more restrictive environments and continue to live their lives in the community where everybody deserves to belong. Mental illness can start before the age of 16. In fact, for my older sister, her first psychiatric admission was at nine years old. My younger sister's was at seven. Um, maybe had my older sister had access to Youth Act services, she would still be here today, but instead she ended her life to suicide at 18 years old. I remember during my time on the EQ team, my 21st birthday come, came up in discussions often. It was a day that I dreaded as I didn't know if I would be better by then. I didn't know what I would do after my 21st birthday if I still needed that levels of support as I have a disassociative disorder, not a psychotic disorder. I didn't know if I would have enough support after my 21st birthday to keep myself alive. Had I known that I had four more years of time on the EQ team, I would have had a lot less sleepless nights and endless worries about if I had enough skills to stay alive. I'm lucky that I did have those skills and I'm doing so well now, both personally and professionally, but things could have been much different. I strongly urge you to approve this expansion of services for the Youth Act team to those eight to 25, as you have the ability to save not just lives, but also futures. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Moore, for sharing your story with us this morning. And 
You're already doing great things. So thank you. So the next testifier I have may be just available for questions. Sam Smith from NAMI. Are you testifying or just available for questions? Madam Chair, I'm just available for questions if they come Thanks. up. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Any questions from members for the bill author or testifier? Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Representative Katiza Watoon, thank you for bringing this bill forward. And to uh, Ms. Moore, uh, thank you for your testimony and your life matters. And so thank you for being courageous and, and uh, moving forward. Uh, Representative Katiza Watoon, I note that the age span is quite uh, disparate in terms of just the uh, both mental as well as emotional and physical uh, growth of individuals. Uh, and it is a non-residential rehabilitative service, but I'm sure that they're uh, going to central locations for uh, the uh, counseling. Um, are they uh, in the same proximity to uh, say an eight-year-old to a 26-year-old? What safety precautions uh, are being afforded to these individuals, particularly in the um, precarious state that they might be? Uh, and be, being vulnerable to others that might also be in precarious states as well. Um, how do we make sure that their safety is of the utmost concern? Representative Kotiza Watoon, would you like to answer that or should I get, have Mr. Smith answer That's a that? great question. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think I will let Mr. Smith answer that. Mr. Smith. Madam Chair, Representative Albright, thank you for the question. One important protection, because it is a broad age range, is that teams would be serving youth between the ages of 8 to 16 or 14 to 25, but it still is a larger gap. And it's important to remember that this is a team-based service that, service that can be provided in the home or in the community in a lot of different settings. And we approached the Youth Act providers about the age ranges here, and they thought that they they made sense. And, and so they, we did think it was going to work out okay. But I hope that answers your question. Can I add Mr. as Mr. well? Mr. Mrs. Moore, Ms. Moore. Um, I want to add as well, when I was on the Youth Act team, as well as I still stay in contact with some of the team, they do all of their services either in school or at home. It is almost... Um, never happens where anybody goes in to do services. That is one of the big benefits of the ACT team is that the, the services are received um, in the community, not in a, in a treatment program or at the office. Thank you, Ms. Moore. Any other questions from members? Seeing none, Representative Kutiza Batoon, closing comments. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I think, um, you know, with with Ms. Moore sharing her testimony, we can just see how how needed uh, this this type of expansion of this program is. And I appreciate Ms. Moore's uh, sharing her story and for the support of members, so that we can make sure that all of our children and youth get the services that they need to um, to maybe get back on track and and continue um, living their lives. Thank you. And I don't have a fiscal note for this. Is that correct, Representative Kutisa Watoon? No, that's correct. Okay, so we'll wait on the fiscal note. So we appreciate you bringing this bill forward and we appreciate all the work that was done on Chair Fisher's committee with the bill. And thank you to our testifiers for being with us today. So with that members, House File 2011 will be laid over for possible inclusion in our human services finance bill. Okay, next for consideration is House File um, 1929. This bill will be laid over for possible inclusion. So let's see, right, Vice Chair Bonner, would you like to move House File 1929 so it's before our committee and your amendment? Yes, Madam Chair, I would like to move House File 1929. And I do have the A2 amendment, which makes minor technical clarity changes and helps us to align with the work of Chair Nelson in the Senate. Okay, so Vice Chair Bonner um, moves the A2 amendment for House File 1929. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any aye. opposed? Okay, the motion prevails and the A2 amendment is adopted. Vice Chair Bonner, to your bill as amended. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Um, there's nothing harder than watching someone you love struggle. Uh, barely recognizing the person you know and love uh, wondering if the essence of who they are remains beneath the surface, uh, to feel as if they're slipping through your fingers. Psychosis is a disabling condition that disrupts thoughts and reality. 
making reality seem fluid and hard to grasp. You may hear or see things that others don't, leading to anxiety and apprehension, pulling away of family and friends, while surfing a wave of emotions from extreme highs to the desolation of no feeling at all. Psychosis can be triggered by conditions like schizophrenia, one of the most debilitating conditions in the world. Three out of 100 people will experience it in their lifetime. Early psychosis or first episode psychosis is frightening for those who live it and painful for the families to, who watch or to comprehend. Often starting in early adulthood, we don't know how to prevent these conditions, but we know psychosis is a first warning sign. Groundbreaking research shows that early intervention can dramatically alter the trajectory of the lives of those who experience it. For this reason, states are mandated to dedicate 10% of their federal behavioral health block grant to first episode programs. The need is real. The current programs are overflowing and the wait list of four months is the longest since the program's inception. The bill invests in programs proven to provide better improvements in symptoms, relationships, quality of life, greater engagement in work or school. We know that early intervention equals better outcomes. The bill expands these more holistic practices that include family and recovery to include bipolar and extreme depression and seeks to expand it to meet the needs across the state. I bring the bill today as someone who knows the helpless feeling of watching someone I love deeply feel as if they're slipping away. This bill does more than fill a line on, a, on an item on a budget. It provides hope for patients and for families who desperately need it. And with that, I do have a summary of the program in your packets available for you. And with that, I do have one testifier, uh, uh, Ms. Howe, and I have uh, Sam, from Smith from NAMI here to answer additional questions. Thank you, Vice Chair Bonner. So the first testifier, Nancy Howe, welcome to the committee. Please state your name and affiliation and proceed with your testimony. Good morning and thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Nancy Howe and I'm the parent of a young adult who has struggled with a severe mental illness for over 16 years. I'm testifying in support of House File 1929 regarding continued funding for first episode psychosis programs. My 31-year-old son was diagnosed with schizophrenia as a junior in high school. Before he became ill, he played the violin, was in drama and debate, played football, loved to snowboard, and was well-liked among his peers. Sadly, life for our family changed forever on September 23rd, 2006, when he experienced his first episode of psychosis. After being hospitalized, my son didn't have access to adequate services, which would have aided in his recovery at that time. With the isolation that comes from having no work or purpose in his days, the voices often return. He recently described the anguish of living with dulled emotions, impaired memory, and the inability to think clearly as living in a prison in his own mind. Since that initial episode, he has been hospitalized 13 times, has been in two 90-day residential treatment programs, and is currently under civil commitment to take his medication. Sadly, with each hospitalization, his cognitive functioning has decreased and he has become more mentally disabled. Because of this disability, he hasn't attended college, is unable to work, he's no longer able to live on his own and has been living in an adult foster care group home for the past two years. A truly tragic situation, considering that at one time he had an IQ of 124, a bright creative mind with hopes for a wife, children and fulfilling career. There is significant research that demonstrates that the earlier a first episode of psychosis is identified and treated, the better the long-term prognosis becomes. This support is accomplished through a coordinated specialty care model called Navigate, a team of mental health professionals who offer wraparound services for those who've experienced a first episode of psychosis. For the past two years, I have served on our lo local Navigate teams as a family peer support specialist and I've witnessed firsthand the success individuals experience when they do receive proper medication, individual resiliency therapy, and are able to get back to work and get back to school. 
I've witnessed families thrive due to the opportunity for family education and support and access to resources through NAMI Minnesota. Having adequate funding in place for these programs is critical. Offering treatment and support for the patient and family from the onset of the illness is essential to the individual's ability to develop into a contributing member of our community. So please join me in advocating for these necessary services so that others experiencing the disabling symptoms of psychosis will have the opportunity for healing and wholeness. Thank you for your time and consideration today. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Howe. Any questions from members? Representative Moeller. Thank you, Madam Chair. I don't have a question. I just wanna thank Ms. Howe for her testimony and Representative Bonner for bringing this bill. And just also, um, this is just such an important issue and I'm so glad that you're bringing it to light. Um, I had the opportunity to read former Representative Mindy Greiling's book, Fix What You Can, and it does an even deeper dive into all of this. And I just would really encourage other members um, of this committee to take a look at that book if they have the chance. Thank you so much. Thank you, Representative Muller. I also read that book before session. Um, I definitely second that recommendation. Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Bonner. Um, I know uh, that existing law already allows grant funding for interventions for both uh, first episodes of psychosis. Um, kind of a, a, a two uh, part question. How much funding do you foresee using on these grants because I see there's an open appropriation for both fiscal year 22 and fiscal year 23 uh, for both so psychotic episodes as well as boost, uh, first episode of mood disorders. Uh, and then uh, just to follow on to that, uh, in the past, what funding level has been uh, utilized and uh, what have been the outcomes from those grants? Vice Chair Bonner. Thank you. Um, uh, it should be noted, and I'll let Sam kind of chip in here and, and make sure that I he keeps me honest. Um, much of the funding for these programs is actually covered uh, by um, uh, medical coverage, um, but the program itself, it, there is some cost to administering it. Uh, currently, the regular program is, I believe, about 350000 and Sam, you can correct me, per year. Um, there is, um, there will likely be about a 350 one-time um, setup cost to expand this to include the mood disorders, which is bipolar and extreme bouts of depression. And then they expect that the program would have a similar cost uh, per year. And Sam it, from NAMI is here if you want to uh, kind of uh, chime in and make sure that I've accurately reflected that. Mr. Smith? Madam Chair, Representative Albright, uh, Representative Bonner is correct that that is the uh, kind of approximate cost of adding a new program. I would note that there are currently four providers, three in the metro and one in Duluth, and we do think there is a significant need across greater Minnesota for this service. And as Representative Bonner mentioned, many or most of the services provided by first episode programs can bill medical assistance, other insurance plans, but that there are some portions of the service that aren't billable, including employment and education supports, which we think are extremely important so that we are allowing these young people with psychosis to continue taking steps forward in their career and educational goals. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Other questions from members? Not seeing any. Chair Liebling? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. And um, you know, just um, first of all, thank you to the testifier for um, discussing this. And it's, it certainly is an important issue. And I was uh, lucky enough to serve with Representative Greiling and got to know her quite well and um, haven't been able to read her book, however, but I hope to do that. But um, the question is, we, are, are, we have, I think over the years, um, been trying at least to build, a, to build a mental health system. And now we have the um, CCBHHS, if I have the acronym right, the Community uh, Behavioral Health Wraparound Service Centers. And I'm just wondering if there's an interaction with this because you know the system is different than it was when Representative Greiling was serving. And I know this particular issue was one of great concern to her. And I just wonder if 
you know, where we've moved since that time, if we have. Mr. Smith, I believe Chair Liebling is referring to CABHS. Yes, CAC thank CABs. you, ma'am. Okay, Mr. Thank Smith. You. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, Representative Liebling. Thank you for the question. So the community, the uh, CABS program is a uh, state operated treatment program in the Wilmer area and which provides really important support for young people with very high needs. And I think our hope would be that by having you know earlier referral and treatment that we could be making an intervention before any kind of placement in state operated services would become necessary. And so I think that's more than anything, I think what is so promising and exciting about continued investments in first episode psychosis programs. And um, Mr. Smith, how many beds are at the Wilmer? Is it 16 or? Madam Chair, I would defer to the department on that. I don't have that information off the and top of my Madam head. Chair. Chair Liebling. I'm sorry, that really wasn't what I was asking. It was about the community uh, behavioral oh. health centers. Mr. Smith? Madam Chair, uh, Representative Liebling, yeah, I thought you might be referring to Certified Community Behavioral Health Clinics, or CCBHCs, which is an extremely promising model that's thankfully no longer a pilot project here in Minnesota that really is connecting people with services earlier. And I think there's a really strong synergy between the CCBHC model and first episode where what's most exciting about CCBHCs is the, the ease with which people kind of can begin accessing services and supports and could potentially make a referral to a first episode program, which is going to be providing a more kind of intensive and focused support for people with that first episode of psychosis. But a really, I think, promising direction. Thank you. Too many acronyms, Charlie Blaine. <laughs> and they're very close. Representative Keel. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, uh, having carried that, that uh, bill when we did the clinics, um, I just wanted to point out that, that uh, I know there's one based in Northwestern Minnesota that's probably well, one of the pilot projects that has existed and very successful. I do not know um, if they're dealing with the day treatments. I assume that because they're doing quite a bit of successful um, programming that, um, and heard great things. But Chair Liebling, I too have the problem with that acronym, even though I, I carried the bill. So it's just a mouthful. But um, that has been a real successful program. Uh, and I hope we can use more of that to address those immediate issues because that was the intent of that program was to deal with the right of ways. I need help. There's something wrong um, to be able to help families. And, and uh, certainly I would encourage people because I have a really good friend that is very successful, but had a lot of bipolar problems. And, and um, it, it just is really helps us to live life and be successful in more than just um, that medical issue. It's kind of like having all kinds of other health problems um, that are long-term. You have to deal with them so that you can move on. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Kiel, for working on that legislation. We appreciate it. Vice Chair Bonner, any closing comments? Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Um, really, this bill is about giving people a good start and making sure that we can change that trajectory um, and by early intervention. And I know that so many families um, in this situation feel helpless. Um, and the ability to have a program that really has a more holistic approach where family can be involved and really take an active role in being able to change that trajectory is something that's really um, important. And so I thank you all and I urge your support. Thank you, Vice Chair Bonner. With that, House File 1929, as amended, will be laid over for possible inclusion in the Human Services Finance Bill. The last item before we go to recess is House File 2116. Representative Frederick, would you like to move the division report from behavioral health? I move, Madam Chair. Thank you. Representative Frederick moves the division report from behavioral health. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion prevails and the division report is adopted. So House File 2116 will be laid over for possible inclusion in our Human Services Finance Report. I'll move it so it's in front of our committee. Representative Frederick to House File 2116. And I don't see any amendments. Uh, no, Madam Chair. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, House File 2116 is a paperwork reduction bill. We have heard in uh, this committee, we've heard in behavioral health, the need for providers um, in mental health, in the substance use disorder world, all across the state uh, in lots of different ways. And what this bill does is it takes a look at that need uh, from a slightly different angle. And what it does is it, it looks at the current providers that we have in the substance use disorder world, and it, it is trying to address how can we get them more face time to the people that they or virtual face time uh, to the people that they're serving. And so it's, it's a way or an attempt anyways to increase efficiency uh, so we can continue providing more services because we all know that um, the citizens across the state need them. Uh, and at this point, I would turn it over to uh, my testifier to go into more detail. Thank you, Representative Frederick. We have Lance Egley. Please introduce yourself and your affiliation and then proceed. Yes, Honorable Committee Chair Schultz and members of the committee. My name is Lance Egley, testifying for the March Professional Association. March has previously testified before the Behavioral Health Policy Division of this committee that House File 2116 formalizes a collaborative relationship between Department of Human Services and substance use disorder providers to reduce paperwork, improve systems, and make regulation more consistent. This bill improves the capacity to achieve these goals and cements together the voluntary and legislative efforts. In the Behavioral Health Policy Division, amendments were made that are needed some further understanding. Representative Frederick was helpful in bringing March and DHS together to further our understanding of each other. We reached agreement in each area of the amendment. Regarding uh, the change of the word test to assess, March meant to include whatever word is used, actively observational short-term mini experiments uh, like computer alpha testing, uh, just to see if things would work out, in addition to listening and analysis. In the discussions, we realized that DHS does not yet have the same understanding of what these are as does March. So we have decided to pursue this better understanding through our voluntary efforts and not in the wording of legislation. We do want the legislature to understand that with either word, March never meant a complete evaluation of all the changes we will recommend only selective exploration. Regarding the option to relax qualifications of the vendor, uh, DHS indicated that they would first be required to put out an RFP under the original criteria. March is confident that a qualified vendor will apply, and so we are not concerned about the uh, option being needed if that fails. Uh, we've submitted an exhibit showing that this has been accomplished in other states and how much has been accomplished effectively uh, using a properly experienced vendor as a guide. We now understand that the amendment continues to dedicate $200,000 for the first year to the vendor and adds dedication of the 118,000 in the second year to the vendor. For this, March is thankful to both DHS and Representative Frederick. Thank you, Chairman Schultz, Representative Frederick, members of the House Human Services Policy and Finance Committee for your time. We hope you will approve this amended bill. Thank you, Mr. Egley. And I have the fiscal note from this morning, I believe it came in. It's 159,000 for 2022 and 136,000 for 2023. Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative, uh, Excuse me just a second. Frederick, um, when you talk about uh, the consolidation of this to improve the overall process itself, um, you're going to contract with a, a vendor. Two questions. Uh, is this a competitive bid program? And if so, what uh, process will that follow? If not, and you are unilaterally deciding on a vendor, would you declare who that is? Representative Frederick. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, Representative Albright. Uh, from my understanding, and I, I think DHS is here to provide some clarification for that, I think it was, would be a competitive bid program or um, application. Uh, and if they were unable to find um, someone through that process, then they could 
have the option to find someone specific, more specifically in a targeted way. Uh, but I would welcome any comments DHS would have on that uh, topic. Thank you. Do we have someone from DHS that could help answer that question about the competitive bidding process and vendor selection? Ms. Grom? We cannot hear you, Ms. Grom. Apologies, Christy Grom with the Department of Human Services. Um, yes, this will be a competitive RFP that we would issue. Um, and if there are more details that members want in that process, we do have um, Ms. Singh who's available um, to answer more questions on that. Thank you, Ms. Grom. Representative Albright. Wondering if uh, Representative Frederick would uh, uh, expand on, uh, we've heard uh, numerous bills that also talk about the uniformity of the mental health services. I'm wondering if he could or would be willing to uh, discuss how the intersection of those uh, uniformity measures would intersect with what he proposes in this bill. Representative Frederick, you want Ms. Ground to take that question? Um, So I, I think that, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I would, I'll defer to, to DHS in, a, in a, just a second. I would say that it, it's not uh, two separate issues. I would say that they can work hand in hand together. Um, I think that uh, the process of uh, like the uniform services standard, if that's what Representative Albright is kind of referring to, um, I would say that that works, it can work in parallel with this. Um, and I think that we should always be trying to strive for efficiencies wherever possible, but I would, Again, welcome any comments from DHS. Ms. Grom? Um, Madam Chair, Representative Albright. Um, so the Mental Health Uniform Services and Standards Phase 1 is um, moving through the, pro the legislative process this session. But subsequent to this session, there will be more work that we'll need to do um, and uh, work around substance use disorder services um, is something that we're looking to incorporate in the future. Um, and then, again, I have Ms. Singh who can answer more detailed questions about some of those, um, the interactions um, on a more specific level. Mr. Egley would like to contribute, I believe. Go ahead. Uh, sure. In the voluntary effort, we are integrating the paperwork reduction and the uniform service standard work. So we're doing our very best to make them work together. Thank you. Ms. Singh? Madam Chair, uh, members, this is Nija Singh. I am the Clinical Behavioral Health Director for Community Supports Administration. And I agree with uh, what uh, Dr. Egley and uh, Representative Fredrickson said, that this is uh, going to be an effort which will be using the same framework that U.S. Uh, Uniform Service Standards has developed, primarily for mental health. And of course, there will be like unique features that the world of SUD, substance use treatment, uh, brings in. So all those like factors will be kept in consideration, but we will not reinvent the wheel because USS has done a lot of work on that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Singh. Representative Keel, your hand is up. Did you have a question? No, ma'am, sorry. I That's will okay. change, take it down. <laughs> Any other questions from members? Seeing none, Representative Frederick, closing comments on your bill. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I uh, would appreciate all the support from the members. Uh, it's just an effort to try to get more service uh, more services available, or more time, I guess, uh, available to the communities uh, throughout the state. So uh, that's at the core of what this bill is about, and I would appreciate the support. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Frederick, and thank you, Mr. Egley, for your testimony today. With that, House File 2116 will be laid over for possible inclusion in our Human Services Finance Bill. Members, thank you so much for asking uh, very succinct questions. Uh, thank you for um, your time this morning. We will recess until 1030, come back, take up two bills on background studies from Representative Edelson, and then begin our overview and discussion and testimony with the governor's budget and supplemental budget. So thank you members, we are in recess. <laughs>